In this video, I will be doing a refutation of Epiusion Apologetics, which is a YouTube channel. You can see some clips from his videos in the slideshow. I will be aiming to demonstrate that he preaches a false gospel and to take a defensive stance for the biblical gospel. Now you might wonder, why spend time exposing and refuting Epiusion Apologetics? Well, it doesn't have to be him specifically. He is merely my chosen target to pilot my first detailed attempt at refutation. Like my channel, he is relatively new to YouTube, has a fairly small audience. Most of his videos focus on issues relating to salvation, such as how are we saved? Can we lose our salvation? Is it by faith alone or faith and works? He does some fairly lengthy videos where he covers a lot of scripture in detail. We have fairly similar goals with both of our channels, except that for the notable difference being that I believe in eternal security and faith alone, he believes in conditional security and faith plus works. I don't want refutations to be the primary purpose of my channel, but I do want to show you how false prophets misunderstand, misapply or deliberately misuse what the Bible says, certain emotional or mental gymnastics and misinformation they use to persuade or even trick and manipulate you, and how to effectively critique their mishandling of the word, addressing some of the difficult passages they might use against you, understand the logical flaws they make, and take a stand for faith alone and eternal security. He will always have his camp of followers that will never repent from their position of work salvation and conditional security. Likewise, there will always be those of us who won't budge from faith only salvation and eternal security. However, there is always the small third group of people that are listening to both sides and are very confused and frustrated because they just want to hear the truth and they are hearing mixed messages from each side throwing a bunch of Bible passages at them and they don't know what to believe anymore and these are the people that I hope to win over. Now some important disclaimers that I want to mention. This is not a personal attack. Uh, we do not have any ongoing feuds. I do not have a personal vendetta against him. I have never met him in person or spoke to him before uh, beyond a handful of YouTube comments on his content. We won't be attacking the way that he looks or talks or dresses. This is purely about the gospel that he preaches. I won't make any promises, but I'm going to try and keep this refutation civil and not resort to unhelpful name calling or mockery of an immature nature, because the, the goal is that I want to win people over with compelling arguments. I don't want exposure of false prophets to be the main purpose of my channel and what I am well known for. Now, the Bible does command us to mark, reprove and avoid false prophets, but there are some YouTube channels where that is literally all they do in almost every single video, exposing every false person under the sun. But if this becomes our focus, we end up talking more about what God is not doing rather than about the kingdom of God. And Jesus did emphasize the kingdom of God in his gospels. And I would rather edify you by showing you what is right rather than pointing out every single person in the world who is wrong. But I will attempt to do both in this refutation, show you that he is wrong and to edify you by showing you what is right. I'm working on my series Biblical Salvation Settled Once and For All and with each video I am only progressing one chapter of the New Testament at a time. It will take me a very long time to get to some of the difficult chapters in the Bible. Doing this refutation now will give me an opportunity to address some difficult passages fairly early in my channel's existence. As I already mentioned in the previous slide, it doesn't have to be him. I, I could have picked on anybody really, but because both of our channels focus on gospel related issues and we both use a lot of scripture to back up what we believe, it seems appropriate to choose him. Crucially, I want to do an in-depth, well thought out, proper refutation. Anybody on the internet can do a 20 minute video showing footage of somebody, quote a bunch of conveniently selected Bible passages, label somebody a false prophet and call it a day. This is far too easy to do and both sides can do this. I could do it to him, he could do it to me. And all it does is please their fans and regular viewers. It doesn't edify towards the acknowledgement of truth. I want to help the people on the fringes who are hearing both sides of the debate, faith alone versus faith plus works, eternal security versus conditional security, who are sick and tired of all the mixed messages out there and are so confused and frustrated with what the Bible says that they just don't know what to believe anymore. 
Maybe, just maybe, I will convince some hardcore work salvationists, but this is probably highly unlikely. Now let's have a quick comparison of our views before we begin. This is the difference in what we believe. So uh, he, although he doesn't claim to be an Arminianist, or I, I've never heard him mention Arminianism specifically, it would seem as if his doctrine is that way leaning. Uh, I fall under the category of free grace, but I have also mentioned Calvinism or Reformed theology in the middle because I've noticed that sometimes he lumps certain aspects of Calvinism with free grace as if they are the same thing, and they're really not. And actually, from where I'm standing, I would say that Calvinism actually has more in common with what he believes because it's really Arminianism with a degree of fatalism mixed in there. Or you might say Arminianism is Calvinism with the fatalism filtered out. So, on the issues of works for salvation, he believes that you have to have faith and works to be saved. Now, the Calvinist and Reformed position is, they'll say it's faith alone, but true faith must produce works to be considered genuine. So, I would argue that it's actually faith plus works anyway, but it wears a faith alone disguise. Whereas me being free grace, I absolutely do believe it is faith alone. For security of salvation, so he believes in conditional security. This is that you can lose your salvation if you don't have good works. Calvinism and Reformed believes in a doctrine called perseverance of the saints, and Epiusio and Apologetic sometimes mixes this with eternal security. But they're not entirely the same thing, because the perseverance doctrine is that you cannot lose salvation, but if you don't have good works, then they will argue that you were never saved in the first place. Whereas the free grace definition of eternal security is that you cannot lose salvation, and actually you won't necessarily persevere in works, but you will presumably persevere in faith, even if without good works. And if you don't have that faith, if you don't maintain your faith, and let's say someone wanders off and becomes an atheist or a Christ-rejecting reprobate or something like that, then we would say that they were never saved to begin with. So there's the difference in security. And it's important not to mix the Calvinist view with the free grace view, because the free grace view is entirely without works, whereas the Calvinist view isn't necessarily. And it's more like the Arminianist view, it does include works. Although Calvinists do vary in exactly how they uh, define that, they're not always consistent with their definition. Regarding free will, so again, aligning with the Arminianist type of a view, he believes that salvation is entirely subject to the free will of man. Man has a full decision on whether he is saved or not. Because a person can choose to be saved, then he can also choose to forfeit his salvation. That's what Epiusion would, would argue. Now, the Calvinist and Reformed position is that salvation is entirely subject to the will of God. God has already predetermined who goes to heaven, who goes to hell, and nobody can do anything about it. Because a person cannot choose to be saved, he then therefore cannot choose to then not be saved. Now, in the free grace view, we don't really have an ism for this, because this is probably the biggest area where the isms tend to argue with each other. But in free grace, free will and predestination are not considered to be in opposition. They both fit hand in hand from our view. God predestines those he knows who will believe. Why one person believes and another doesn't, we do not presume to know with certainty, or at least I don't presume to know with certainty. As Jesus said, the wind blows where it will. You can't tell from where it came or where it's going. So is everyone who's born again. So we, I wouldn't exactly use the word choice because it's not exactly part of Jesus's lingo, particularly in the Gospel of John. But I would say a person can accept the open, open invitation to be saved, but it is a permanent decision that cannot be undone. And I will explain uh, that later uh, in this refutation. And then on the issue of backsliding, which is falling into sin, Epiusio and Apologetics would argue that a backslider is at serious risk of losing their salvation by their free will. They are choosing to forfeit it. They need to get back on their feet to keep or regain their salvation. Now, the Calvinist and Reform view is that God will always get a truly saved backslider back on their feet. So yes, people will backslide. Yes, people will fall, but they will always get back up again and God will always get them back on, on the good books. If they continue to backslide and they just go on a downward spiral, then the Calvinists and Reforms will probably argue that they were never really saved to begin with. 
Now in the free grace view, a backslider falling into fleshly sin is still eternally saved, but they will be chastised sorely on this earth. Now if somebody does backslide into unbelief and gross heresy, then yes, in that scenario, we would say that they were never likely saved to begin with. But we always go with what they believe, not on what they do. So someone backsliding into sin doesn't forfeit their salvation. But the earthly chastisement deals with this issue. So this is how I will proceed. First, I will attempt to discredit his integrity. I will attempt to convince viewers that he is disingenuous, dishonest and incredulous, often willfully, but mercifully I will concede that sometimes it may be unintentional. I will assert that he misrepresents and or is willfully ignorant of what free grace actually believes and proclaims. He strawmans opponents with false hypotheticals and accusations. He sometimes lumps Calvinism and free grace together as if they are almost the same thing. His logical arguments debunk themselves. He has a false view of how the world really works, particularly in relation to false Christianity and the repentance issue. He cherry picks contradictory argument points if and when it suits him. And following that, he has absolutely no grasp of irony in his interpretations of scripture whatsoever. He tragically mishandles the Bible. Sometimes I think he does it deliberately. Sometimes I think maybe he just does it ignorantly. He often quote minds passages without important contextual verses so that he can alter the narrative, teaching something very different from what the verses were intended to teach or communicate. And he misquotes or miscues verses by reading words into the text that aren't actually there. For example, the Bible might say the word fall and then he reads the words loses his salvation. He just plonks those words on top of it even in passages where the security of the believer is not actually a relevant subject matter. And then once I have discredited his integrity, I will refute the gospel that he preaches as thoroughly as I possibly can. And depending on how much footage I produce doing this, if it's not too much, then I may also address similar tactics and blunders of people he associates with, such as Chip Lutick and Hal Chaffee. So the first thing that I want to show you, particularly in, in the way that he asserts that the Bible is his authority, is the way that he picks contradictory argument points if and when it suits him. So in this video, this is not particularly about salvation per se, but he's talking about charismatics and holiness preachers, which he tends to look at cessationists and Calvinists. And the point that he's going to make in this video is that we, we don't go by groups, we, we go with sound biblical doctrine. So I'm just going to show you uh, clips of him saying this in this video. You don't want to go off over there and end up, uh, you know, just going off the rails and not regarding the Bible very highly. No, you have to stick with us. And they tout themselves and they hold themselves up to be the, the ones with sound biblical doctrine and study the word. Even though Calvinist and cessationist, this is, this is known heresy. These are unbiblical and you know, denying the gifts of the Spirit, that's that's not sound doctrine, okay? But yet, they at least hold themselves up to this standard that they are the ones with sound, sound biblical doctrine, and these charismatics over here, no, they, they don't have sound biblical doctrine. So although I haven't given you all of the context as to what he's talking about here, he's saying that we, we don't typically think of the charismatics as having sound biblical doctrine. So then we have the cessationists and Calvinists that are saying, come over here. But then he's also arguing that they're also heretical and not, not sound. They're, they're unbiblical is what he's arguing about. So it, so he seems to be emphasizing the point that we need sound biblical doctrine. Okay. That's what we go for. And he's going to further qualify this later in this video. We look to Jesus. Listen, we don't look to any denomination. We don't look to any organization or person. We look to Jesus. We don't, we don't look at the church of Christ and say, well, you know, my denomination doesn't really believe that. No, we don't look to the Calvinist. We don't look to cessationist. We don't look to the charismatics. We don't look to, to any of these people or organizations or groups. We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. So you've heard it expressed there, folks. We're not following people. We're not following denominations. We're not following groups of people. We don't go with what people say. We don't go with what the church says. We go with Jesus, which I assume, based on what he said earlier, he means sound biblical doctrine. That's what we go. We don't base our beliefs on 
what people say or what the church typically interprets. Okay, we go with the Bible and that's where we base our doctrine. So just to further qualify on that then, just to absolutely prove, you know, we're not, we're not taking this guy out of context, we're not misrepresenting this guy. This is a couple of other videos where he's going to say the same thing. We follow the Bible, we don't follow the doctrines of men. So the two videos are My Journey Out of One Saved Always Saved and The Doctrines of Men, where he's, he's going to uh, build on this, this exact same point. The, the Bible says, let Jesus said, let call no man your teacher because you have one teacher and that's the Christ. You call no man your teacher. You don't call you don't call John Piper your teacher. Okay, you, you don't you don't go to uh, men to tell you the truth and just believe the first thing they say. We go to the Holy Spirit, right? That's what we should do. We, we go to the Bible. We we dig in. We don't just believe the first thing that, per, that somebody tells us. Well, I, I know this verse seems like this, but. Um, but, but, well, I mean, John Piper said this, so he's smarter than me, so I'll just go with him. No. Many in the church today would agree that we should not be following doctrines of men. They love to put down Catholics and every other denomination that's, you know, not their own, of course. And they love to point their finger and say, look at that denomination over there. They're following doctrines of men. But they're not realizing that they're all hypocrites and they're not realizing that their very own denomination has its own set of man-made doctrines that they will stand up for and defend as well. So he's made it very clear. We don't follow men, okay? We go with the Bible. We go with what God said. We follow Jesus. We don't follow men. We don't follow denominations. We don't follow the church or whoever. We follow God not men. Now he's going to tell you in this video where it's titled top five reasons why one saved always saved is false. He's going to tell you which man, because remember we're not following the doctrines of men, he's going to tell you which man invented this doctrine. And I want you to remember who he says, okay? Number one, this is a man-made doctrine. This doctrine wasn't created until the 1500s. So that means it's only a few hundred years old. Once saved, always saved comes from the P in TULIP, which is the five-point doctrine of Calvinism. The P stands for perseverance of the saints, which means that true saints of God will persevere to the end, and there's nothing that they can do or not do to make it into the kingdom. This quite literally is a man-made doctrine, because at the head of it all is a man named John Calvin. This is where it all comes from. And I've even had people quote John Calvin and other early church reformers, instead of the Bible. So I hope you're keeping up with me so far. He's claiming that one saved, always saved, or eternal security, whatever you want to call it, it's a man-made doctrine, and bearing in mind we don't follow the doctrines of men, as he's just said, and it was created in the 1500s. So that's, that's quite a long time after Christ. So man-made doctrine invented quite some time later, so it's, in his assertion, literally a man-made doctrine. Well, what we're going to do is keep watching this video because I want to show you then what reason number two is why this is allegedly a false man-made doctrine, okay? Number two, church history. This doctrine was not present in church history prior to the 1500s for thousands of years. There's no evidence that the Jews believed in it. The Catholic Church certainly didn't subscribe to it. Now, there's many differences that we have with the Catholic Church, but it still doesn't change the fact that for thousands of years through church history, whether it was before Christ or after Christ, this doctrine was nowhere to be found. Like I said, it's only a few hundred years old. For this reason and this reason alone, we should have reason for great concern. So this is very interesting here, folks, because now what he's done is he's changed his standard. You see, when he was dealing with the charismatics and the Calvinists, it was convenient for him to emphasize biblical doctrine and that we don't follow the doctrines of men. But now his argument point for saying that this is a doctrine of men is that for thousands of years, I, I don't know if he meant hundreds, perhaps that's a mistake because it's less than 2000, but he's asserting that men haven't believed it, whether it's men in the Catholic church or Jews, that the men of the Jews or men in church history in generally, well, they didn't believe it so we shouldn't believe it. But wasn't his standard that we shouldn't follow the doctrines of men? So why does it matter 
if they didn't believe it, because I thought we were going by what the Bible says. But you'll see this become apparent that he he picks his standards when it suits him in a particular argument for doing so. Because if he ever actually bumps into somebody who actually knows the Bible, who believes in once saved, always saved, well, just saying we need biblical doctrine isn't going to work because there are people, believe it or not, who actually believe this and do know the Bible. Now, he tries to straw man faith alone focus, not uh, but understanding or knowing the Bible very well. well. We'll unpack that later. But we're not following the doctrines best. So then who cares what people have believed for thousands of years? It, it doesn't seem to occur to him the irony that for hundreds of years, people have been wrong about stuff. I mean, he already alluded to the issue of the Catholic Church that we disagree on a lot of issues. So we assume that they're wrong about infant baptism. We assume that they're wrong about bowing down to idols. But somehow they're right about one say well conditional security for some bizarre reason and even with the jews jesus was constantly telling the jews how wrong they were everything wrong with what they believed everything wrong with righteousness by the law but again we assume then that they were right about conditional security for some bizarre reason so you see how his arguments start to contradict each other because he changes it whenever it suits him to do so now here's here's another one of his videos it's titled don't be fooled Oh, sassers, those who believe in eternal security, are not obeying Jesus' commands, and here's five proofs. And the first proof that he's going to give you is a reference to the early uh, church. Bearing in mind that uh, we, we've just been told that we don't follow the doctrines of men, but now we need to go back to what men believe. So watch the arguments that he's going to use here, and watch who he says made this doctrine popular. Bearing in mind that in the other video we just watched, he said it was Calvin, okay, who created it, and several hundred years after Christ. Number one, it's heresy. None of the early church fathers believed in eternal security for the first several hundred years of Christianity. Now just think about that for a minute. In fact, it wasn't until Augustine came along that this doctrine of eternal security really took hold. And in fact, prior to him, the only ones that believed in this doctrine were the Gnostics. And these were the ones that the apostles fought so hard against. So I hope you paid attention to that, folks. We've, we've now changed the standard again. You see, a moment ago, it was John Calvin who invented this, uh, well, created this doctrine 1500 years, uh, you know, after Christ almost. But now he's saying that Augustine made it popular. And even then, it was the Gnostics that the apostles uh, were wrestling against, that were fighting against, that invented this doctrine. Well, how could the how could the apostles be wrestling against Gnostic heresy of one saved, always saved, or eternal security, if it wasn't invented until Calvin in the 1500s? And how could Augustine have popularized it in the 300s and 400s if it wasn't invented by Calvin in the 15 you know until the 1500s? So. You might wonder, well, well, maybe he was just mistaken when he said Calvin, because when, when he mentioned Calvin, that was earlier in his channel, uh, you know, maybe he was mistaken about that and he's done some more research and, you know, he's just changed his position on it. And, and you know, people make mistakes. I, I'm open to that possibility. Well, on his channel, he did a, a very specific video about Calvin. Uh, and again, he re referenced um, Calvin introducing eternal security. He's not made any video as far as I'm aware of that he admitted that he was mistaken about Calvin creating it. So uh, I'm not aware that he's recanted that position and, and made a point about it. Uh, on, on the original video where he claimed Calvin created it, there's no pinned comment to say that he's changed his position on it. And uh, once again, if we scroll down these comments, you see it, now he's changed it now. So in this particular comment about two weeks fr ago from uh, the time I record this, he now says that Calvin definitely made it popular. You know, he created it early, but, but now he just made it popular. And then he starts referencing the uh, Gnostics again. So, you know, it's, it's actually the Gnostics who uh, were actually the, one, the, the ones that introduced this. So that was about two weeks ago when he said it was the, the Gnostics. Further down, let's see if I can find this. Uh, he said here, Osas is the same lie that the devil uh, told Eve back in Genesis 3, 4. That was two months ago. So we've gone from Calvin to, uh, what's his name, Augustine, to the Gnostics, to uh, all the way back to Genesis, and then back to the Gnostics again. You see, it, it's convenient for him to change the story 
for different people that he's talking to if and when it suits him. He can't get his own story straight. It, it shouldn't be difficult for him to pinpoint somebody and say, this person invented it. Okay. And uh, we're going to debunk some of those claims, by the way. The whole thing about Genesis is wrong uh, because it's not actually fallen from salvation because salvation is a problematic word to refer to pre-fall. Uh, we're going to deal with the issue of the Gnostics because they actually twist what uh, we actually have record recorded of what the Gnostics uh, believed. So you see how he's changing the narrative when it suits him. He changes his answer. He doesn't actually have a defined answer on this. He changes it when it suits him, depending on what point he's trying to make. And once again, he, he's, he's trying to argue from what did men believe, even though he's already told us not to follow men. And, and this is how his, it, I don't even have to do any work. His own arguments debunk themselves. So you can see that from here on, it's going to be pretty easy to take down what this guy believes because his, his foundations are set on sand, to be perfectly honest with you. And so one more point that I want to make on this issue of authority is something that he says in this video about his experience with the, the Holy Spirit. And again, it's all going down to, you know, do we follow the doctrines of men or do we follow what's in the Bible? So just have a look at a couple of clips from this video, My Journey Out of One Saved, Always Saved. But he began to call me out and and I asked him, I said, you know, so, so I know I'm not going crazy. I need I need a sign to know if this is you. So there was a, a specific verse that I had in mind. And I said, if you can show me this verse, I'm going to grab my Bible. If you can show me this verse right here, um, then then I'll know it's you. And I grabbed my Bible and I opened up the Bible and right there. I mean, my eyes even went smack dab straight to it. And I, I was just, I, I was blown away and I was like, well, okay, this, I mean, th there's no way that the devil could do that. I mean, don't, please don't say that this isn't a big deal. And, and please don't say that I've already, you know, I've already looked into that. I, I've already looked into that. Well, I'm here to tell you that, that why in the world would the Holy Spirit of God lead me every day into, you know, I, I, so lead me every day out of this movement, out of this whole one saved, always saved uh, doctrine that swept the church. Why would he lead me out of that? Show me miracles. Give me affirmation. Now, this is where I don't know if he's actually doing it deliberately or I, I don't know if he actually realizes he's doing this. But this is where we start to get into some rather manipulative arguments because he's is, is now trying to justify what he believes based on the fact that he just opened his Bible and there was a relevant verse. Well, first of all, that, that doesn't only happen to him, okay? That happens to people who believe in one saved, always saved as well. And actually, I've been told by a Muslim that they open the Quran sometimes when they think, and, and there it is, something that they're looking for. So that doesn't really prove anything. It's, it's kind of a, 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 a red herring, to be honest. And there's absolutely no evidence that the, the devil can't possibly do that, that the devil was able to, to try and tempt Jesus using the Bible against him, but Jesus had to rebuke the devil with the Bible. And then he goes on to say that, well, why would the Holy Spirit be leading me out of this? Well, it, it, see, anybody can make that argument. See, I could say, why would the Holy Spirit lead me into one saved, always saved? Well, we do know that God blinds the minds of those who believe not, and he doesn't seem to believe Jesus when Jesus said, all those that the Father gives me, I will lose nothing, in a passage where he's talking about eternal life. So, that again, that doesn't prove anything, and it's it's quite a manipulative thing to say. Whether he realises it's manipulative, I, I don't know. But you see, people who are in their own mind, struggling to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, they're very vulnerable to this because then they think this person hears the Holy Spirit and I don't, so he must know what he's talking about. But again, we're not supposed to follow the doctrines of men. But when you say that the Holy Spirit speaks to you, we only have your word on that. And there's a lot of bozos on YouTube, including people that he would label as false prophets that claim to hear the voice of God. Okay, and a lot of them, by the way, believe in conditional security as well. So, uh, again, this is an authority problem, is that we're, first we're going to the Bible, then we look at what men believed, and, and now we're, we're trying to justify things by what he hears the voice of the Holy Spirit. Well, I've got no way of verifying that. So we, we start to see a conflict of authority there. So that, that's quite a manipulative point that he makes there. But I, I, again, as I say, I don't know whether he realises that. Now, interestingly, folks, after I've already filmed all of my uh, commentary on the Holy Spirit and, and his conflicting authorities... I came across this little gem, and I've not seen this video before, 
Uh, it, it's obviously been on there a while, but it says, how do I know if I've been deceived the spirit of truth? Now, in the first part of the video, he explains that what I've just been saying, different people claim to believe uh, that they hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit can't be telling them all different things, in including the one saved, always saved versus conditional security issue. So I'm not going to replay all of that footage because it, it really only shows what my commentary already was, that we don't go from somebody's arbitrary claims, uh, you know, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. But uh, look what he's going to say at uh, eight minutes uh, and five. Bear in mind, this, this is how you know whether you're being deceived and identifying the spirit of truth. Look at what his argument point is here. Um, but, you know, people can even get led astray with falling into just believing about the early Christians. You know, yes, the early Christians are are great, you know, and I've done videos on them. But the thing is, it's, it's great to go through their work. But the thing is, is that if you make the early Christians your teacher, then you're just simply going to men to interpret what the Bible says. And, and guys, this is not the way. This is not the way. I don't even know how to process that, folks. This is like a parody where he just debunks his own arguments. I mean, what a hypocrite. He told people, he said on his channel, that once saved, always saved is false, because look at what early Christians believed. No early Christians believed. And now we don't interpret the Bible through the early Christians because then we're following men. What a hypocrite. And, and folks, this is the fruit of people. Because remember, these people always want to bang on about how we need to do all these works and how your faith needs to be growing this fruit. Well, this is the fruit of this man, the man that debunks his own arguments, the man that attacks his own doctrine, and the man that picks and chooses arguments when it suits him, depending on who he's talking to. Folks, I give you work salvation and all its wonderful fruit. Depart from me, I never knew you. And so this is going to lead on to... Uh, the next bit where I'm going to talk about um, his hip hypocrisy. So uh, the next thing I'm going to do then is show you that he is a hypocrite. He accuses other people of doing things that he does himself. So this is a video where he exposes another channel called Good Hope, and he accuses this person of chopping up verses and taking a verse out of its intended con context to prove a point. Let's look and see what he says. Blessing is tied to those who do his commandments, plural, but the right to the tree of life is given to those that do his commandment singular. What is the commandment? Look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3, verse 23. And this is his commandment. Straightforward. Very simple. Very clear. Very consistent. That we should what? Believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. What is the commandment? Believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. So he quotes 1 John 3.23 that says, And this is his commandment, singular, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And then he stops there. The only problem is that's not the rest of this verse. The verse actually goes on to say, And love one another just as he commanded us us. So why did Good Hope hide the rest of this verse from his viewers and make it seem like the only thing that we needed to do was the first part of this, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, but yet not quote the rest of this, which would have completely refuted his free grace theology. But not only that, but if we look at the verse immediately prior to this verse, we see that it also refutes his free grace theology. Look at this. It says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. Why? Because we keep his commandments, plural, and do what pleases him. This is the context, friends. He's talking about keeping his commandments. And then he goes on to say that, yes, it's not only believing, but it's also loving your brother loving one another. See, these are the types of word games that he plays in order to deceive his followers. He tries to say, oh, look, it just says commandment. So there's only one thing that we need to do. That's believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and then stops there and hopes that nobody else figures it out, that it goes on to say, 
and love one another just as he has commanded us. So you see it there, folks. He's calling out another channel. And this guy, Good Hope, he, he proclaims one saved, always saved. But he's calling out Good Hope for chopping up a Bible verse and missing some very important context to try and change the narrative from what's actually going on. Okay. And I'm going to show you another video as well where he, he says that we must take things in its proper context. And so this is a video titled Romans 8.1 means no condemnation and on and on. And at the beginning of this video is going to ask you a hypothetical question if people have confronted you with verses out of context. So what he advises you to do is keep reading to get the proper context of what the Bible is saying. So uh, let's have a look at that. Hey guys, if you have ever been given a verse that's been taken out of context so clearly and so blatantly, I want you to go ahead and hit subscribe below because I think it's happened to us all. And I'll, I'll, today I want to give you guys a, a tip, if you will, to alleviate some of these problems when people give you a verse that's taken out of context who support something like, you know, once saved, always saved, or any other kind of false doctrine in the church, okay? I found something that alleviates the problem of people taking verses out of context. And, uh, and what it is, is it's keep reading. Okay, there, there's so many verses that people use just to just cherry pick to support their theological model and they don't keep reading. Okay, so there you have it, folks. He's told you that people take verses out of context. He tells you that people chop up verses and they're wrong to do so. And so people who believe in one saved, always saved, he'll accuse us of doing that, that we're taking things out of context or that we're deliberately not quoting the full thing or chopping bits off early because we don't want you to know about certain things in the Bible. Well, I'm going to show you an example of him doing the same thing in this video right here. So this is everyone who lost their salvation in the New Testament. And the first example he's going to give you is Simon the Magician. Okay. Now, probably one of the most undeniable is Simon the Magician. Okay. Out of Acts 8. It says that Simon the Magician previously practiced magic. Okay, listen to this. He previously practiced magic. This means that he used to do this. So he repented of this. And then it says that he believed. And then after being baptized, okay, so he was baptized. And then he continued with Philip. And then it said that he had received the word. Okay, so what we have here is somebody who repented, believed, and was baptized, and then continued with Philip, and received the word of God. If this doesn't describe a Christian, somebody who's believed, been baptized, repented, uh, and received the word of God, then then I don't know. I don't know what does. And but listen here. This is what Peter says to him. He says, "May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money." You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, see, Peter says that it may not even be possible, says that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So Peter's saying that after he believed, received the word of God, and was baptized, and continued with Philip, after this, he said that he was in need of repentance still, and that he may not even be, it may not even be possible that he be forgiven, because he ended up getting caught in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So this is, this is very clear. Simon believed, and, and you could say, well, he, he didn't really truly believe. Well, see, the burden of proof is on you because it says that he believed. And according to the Bible, Mark 16, 16, it says, whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that's exactly what he did. He believed and was baptized. So there's no reason to think otherwise that he, that he oh, he, he didn't really believe enough or he didn't really have the right kind of belief. It says right here, it says right here that he believed and not only that, but received the word of God. Okay. And he had repented. He wasn't practicing magic anymore. Okay. So let's recap then. He said that Simon is one of the most undeniable 
examples of somebody who lost their salvation. And then he shows Peter's rebuking of Simon as, as demonstrating the point where he lost his salvation. Not, not very long after he believed, it turned out. Well, the first thing that I want you to notice is that in the Acts chapter 8 bit that he's extracted here, he's gone from verse 9 up to 23. Okay. Now, understandably, I don't expect him to provide the entirety of Acts chapter 8. It's not necessary because it, it doesn't all deal with Simon. Okay. But if you're going to accuse somebody of chopping up verses and missing important contextual verses out to change the narrative, well, the problem, if you're going to show all of this, because bearing in mind he's, he's shown most of, of the story there, the one bit that he's left off is verse 24, because verse 24 completes this story. So somehow he was able to provide us a, a generous amount of scripture from 9 all the way to 23, but he couldn't quite make it to, to put verse 24 on there, because verse 24 is really very important to this whole story, it, for, from the point of view that he's trying to express anyway. So where it says that Simon believed, uh, obviously people that he's confronted have tried to tell him it was a false belief or a vain belief. He he seems to argue that it's a, a legitimate belief. I don't have a problem with believing that's a, a legitimate belief. I think Simon genuinely got saved at that point. Now, he then references uh, what Peter says to him here. So Simon purchases the gift of the uh, well, he asks to purchase the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter then rebukes him. Your money perish with you because you thought this. You have no part or lot in this matter. Uh, what what does this matter mean? Well, uh, it's what Simon asked for, the power to give people the Holy Ghost. He has no part in that matter. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. Re repent of this particular wickedness. Pray God, uh, and you know, perhaps your, your heart may be forgiven. I perceive that you're in, in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Now, what I want you to notice... The word salvation is not mentioned. The word eternal life is not mentioned. A warning about going to hell specifically is not mentioned. Okay. It doesn't say anything about that. Now, I want you to hold on to that because I'm, I'm going to come back to that point. Uh, because again, this all comes to do with taking things in their, in their proper context, remember. Well, he's trying to paint Simon out as this really evil person that did this evil, terrible thing. And then Peter's rebuked him because he's such a terrible person. And so he must have lost his salvation because of what a terrible person he is. Well, ask yourself this question, folks. Terrible people, when you try and correct them with the Bible, are they typically uh, responsive to that? Do they typically accept the rebuke? I mean, this guy himself, Epiusion, he's probably dealt with plenty of plenty of people that he's tried to rebuke them with the Bible and they've not accepted correction, okay? He knows what that feels like. Well, let's see how Simon responded to Peter. If, again, if you're going to go for the full context, you know, because we don't want to take things out of context, heaven forbid. Then answered Simon and said, Pray you to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. So Simon seems to be accepting Peter's rebuke here. And this is a very unusual example. He seems to be accepting the correction. And he's appealed to Peter to pray for him that this stuff won't happen to him, that the stuff that Peter mentions there. Okay, this is someone who seems to be, from what we can gather from, from the available information given to us in the passage, that Simon's repentant. But he chopped off the passage at verse 23, Mr. We shouldn't take things out of context. Why? Because that verse wouldn't fit the narrative that he's trying to paint in that video. Now, obviously, I can't prove that he did that deliberately. Maybe he just didn't look properly. Maybe, maybe I don't know. I can't prove it. But me personally, I'm absolutely convinced that he did it deliberately. I think he knows the Bible well enough to know full well what he's doing here. And he's doing the exact same thing, in my opinion, that he accuses other people of. And even if you disagree with me about that, that's fine, because we're barely at the beginning of what I've got to cover in, in this video. So, you know, you just hang on tight. But remember that he, he's made a song and dance about not taking things out of their proper context. OK, well, let me show you an example. Well, not an example. Let me show you an exchange I once had with him from my personal channel. OK. Now, I wasn't able to find the video where I made this original comment. I don't know if the video has been taken down or my comment got deleted by him or, you know, YouTube doing what it does. Maybe it just disappeared into the ether because I, I don't think he does typically delete comments even when they're attacking him. So kudos to him for that, at least. So 
I used, I didn't actually use a biblical argument originally. I, I used a logical argument. If, if, if eternal security is such a dangerous lie, explain why all these denominations, and all of these are bad denominations, by the way, don't believe it. That, that was my assertion. Um, and so, because he, he tries to paint out like one saved, always saved, it's this big dangerous lie that's sort of sweeping through Christianity. And it, it's not really true. Um, it's it sweet. You, you could argue that for evangelical Christianity, maybe, but not Christianity as a whole, because these denominations include millions of people that don't believe it. Okay. They're very, some of them are very vocal about it as well. So then he goes on to say that this same argument about not a single Christian recorded for the first several hundred years believed it, you know, it, it, even though we've just gone through the whole thing about how we don't follow the doctrines of men, yet we have to somehow find a man that believed it to justify it for some reason. So he says it's a Gnostic doctrine. And again, that contradicts what he, what he said elsewhere, but but fine. So he says it's a Gnostic doctrine. Now, uh, I didn't actually take the full comment in my uh, snapshot, so unfortunately I've just lost what his question was. But uh, he asked me something. Presumably it was about, show me an example of somebody who believed eternal security. Well, I pointed out just people from the Bible, because I base it on the Bible. John believed it when he quoted Jesus saying, whosoever believes in me shall not perish. It doesn't say might not perish. And he quoted Jesus saying, I, Jesus, give unto them eternal life and they shall never per perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And, and so on and so on and so on. Well, then he replies saying, um, this is exactly what I'm talking about. These verses are taken completely out of context. But but hang on a minute, because when, when I quote Jesus here saying, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Eternal life is the context. That's a salvation verse, because it's the very subject matter that Jesus is talking about there. Yet, Mr. We Shouldn't Take Things Out of Context here uses a passage that doesn't even mention eternal life, and doesn't mention salvation, to say that somebody lost his salvation. And this is going to come apparent very much so today, is that all of his, a lot of his go-to we can lose our salvation passages, like John 15, Abide in Me, for instance, don't mention eternal life. So then when he does get to an eternal life passage like John 6 or John 10, that like I would use, he has to find the most convoluted ways to, to get around it. And I'm, I'm going to deal with that because I'm really going to have to hammer in this uh, OSAS business later. So there's a lot of hypocrisy here, uh, him taking things out of context while accusing everybody else of taking things out of context. And you can disagree with me, but it's just going to become more and more apparent as we progress through this uh, this takedown. So j just hang in there, to be honest. The next thing that I'm going to uh, demonstrate then is how he strawmans uh, faith alone uh, position. So to start off, there's a, a couple of videos he's done. One is where he receives a faith alone translation through the mail. And then there's another one where he searches by uh, faith alone uh, on the internet. Now, but both of these are joke videos, um, just to point that out, if it's not going to be already obvious. But this is going to show how he uh, strawmans what we actually believe. Okay. Hey guys, I just got this new faith alone translation. So I wanted to do an unboxing and give you guys some of my thoughts on it. Okay, so let's go ahead and open it up here. Okay, now it's supposed to be a pretty easy read, so we'll go ahead and check it out. Oh wow, that's a pretty nice cover. Oh wow, that's thin. It's really thin. Oh. Yeah, this is not worth $79.99. What? This guy's trying to tell me we're saved by works and not by faith alone? Pfft. Wow. You know what? Let me find that one verse that talks about faith alone. Let me see here. Oh, yep, there we go. James 2.24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone? Oh no, this can't be right. And so there you have it, folks. He's trying to make it out as if people on the faith alone position really only have one verse in the in the whole Bible, and that were completely oblivious to the fact that the actual verbatim mention of faith alone in the Bible is only ever in a negative context. Now, really, the the joke's on him because he's the one that produced this, so he's the one that's taken verses out of the Bible, not us. But um, with this issue of faith alone only appearing in a negative context verbatim, well, 
just as a side comment, nothing to do with him. But if a Catholic ever says that to you, just come back at them with the Queen of Heaven, because they call Mary the Queen of Heaven, and that only has a negative connotation multiple times in the Bible. But the thing is, when we say faith alone, what exactly do we mean? Okay, because he's making out as if there's one verse in the whole Bible that says faith alone, and it's in a negative context. Well, when we say faith alone, we mean faith without works however you want to phrase it you could say faith without works you can say faith not of works phrase it however you like and it's not as if we've only got one verse in the, in the bible to go on okay so let, let's let's go through then uh, our verses for faith alone matthew 10:32 whosoever therefore shall confess me before men him will i confess before my father which is in heaven Matthew 21 verses 31 to 32. Verily I say unto you that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and harlots believed him. And you, when you had seen it, repented, not afterward, that you might believe him. Mark 1.15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 16:16 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved but he that believes not shall be damned. John 1:7 The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. John 1:12 But as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. John 2:23 Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that which he did. John three fifteen to 18 that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved he that believes on him is not condemned but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. John 3.36, he that believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 4.14, but whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 4.53, so the Father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, your Son lives, and himself believed, and his whole house. John 5.24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John 5.38, And you have not his word abiding in you, for whom he has sent you believe not. John 6.29, Jesus answered and said unto him, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. John 6, 35 to 36, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that you also have seen me, and believe not. John 6, 39 to 40, And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, which every one which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life and i will raise him up again at the last day john 6 47 verily verily i say unto you he that believes on me has everlasting life john 6 64 but there are some of you that believe not for jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him john 7 38 39 he that believes on me as the scripture has said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water but this spake he of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive for the holy ghost was not yet given because that jesus was not yet glorified john eight twenty four. i said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins for if you believe not that i am he you shall die in your sins john ten twenty five to 29 jesus answered them i told you and you believed not the works that i do in my father's name they bear witness of me but you believe not because you are not of my sheep as i said unto you my sheep hear my voice and i know them and they follow me and i give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand john ten thirty eight. but if i do though you believe me not believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and i in him john eleven twenty five twenty seven. 27 jesus said unto her i am the resurrection and the life he that believes in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this she said unto him yes lord 
I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. John 12:36. While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. John 12, 44 to 46, Jesus cried and said, He that believes on me, believes not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that sees me, sees him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. John twenty thirty one. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life through his name. Acts 2.21 And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 3.36-37 And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptised? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 16.30-31 And the prison keeper brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, and your house. Acts 19.4 Then said Paul, John verily baptised with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Romans 1, 16 to 17 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans 3, 22 to 24 Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3, 27 to 30 Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Romans 4, 2-7 For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Romans 4, 22-24, And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Romans 5, 1-2, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, 8-9, But God commended his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans 5, 15-16, But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. Romans 5, 17 to 18. For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offence of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Romans 5.19 For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Romans 8.24 For we are saved by hope. But what hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Romans 10.9 
that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Romans 10.13 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 11.5-6 Even so then, at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Ephesians 2, 8-9 For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Galatians 2, 16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Galatians 3, 7-9 Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with, with faithful Abraham. Galatians 3, 11 to 12 But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that does them shall live in them. And so, in conclusion, folks, no, we don't just go on one verse. We do actually have a multitude of verses that we can go to, and throughout this video, I'm going to be covering all the verses that he goes to. Now, before I get on to the next part where I'm going to deal with all his doctrine and difficult passages that he turns to and the whole Gnostic accusations and all that kind of stuff, there's one more thing that I want to show you. Now, bearing in mind, this is a man who, so far as proven himself to be hypocritical in, in what we've seen and he strawmanned the faith alone position well this is a video he's going to show you where arguably somebody has strawmanned conditional security now he's titled this the persecution of non-osas is coming now when you think of uh, people in the bible who were filled with the holy ghost perhaps someone like samson or stephen these were bold men these were tough men uh, stephen did, did a great job he, he was stoned to death for what he proclaimed and he proclaimed it anyway this was a tough man who who wasn't afraid and this is a video where he's going to suggest that he's now at risk of being persecuted by people who are osas and faith alone now this is a man who claims to be led by the holy spirit that he's been led into conditional security well let's watch this and see how filled with the holy ghost this man really is if the persecution against people who reject once saved, always saved has not already begun, I think it's begun now. For those of you that don't know Mariah Jones, she has amassed quite a following. As you can see here, over 22,000 subscribers. I originally found out about her because she came across as a suggested video. And just out of sheer curiosity, I decided to check it out because she was giving her testimony out of what she calls legalism. So I was curious. I checked it out. Basically, she has just fallen into the hyper grace movement is what's happened. Well, what happened was a, a few days later, I guess she had backlash on it and she ended up creating this post that was something extraordinarily disturbing. Uh, let me just go ahead and get into it and show you right now. This right here is what she posted. So it's this it's this comic. I don't know if she made this up or if somebody else did. Um, but basically, the whole thing here is that people who reject once saved, always saved are the bully on the right. And they like to apparently pick on little girls and beat them down and make them feel awful. Uh, you can't make this up. We, we just have to go through this. Okay, at the top it says, your salvation is none of their business. And then it goes down and, it's, and has this poor girl crying. And she says, I told you that Jesus saved me and gave me everlasting life. Why don't you leave me alone? And this guy right here, he's wearing a shirt that says, Joy Stealer. Okay, so this is the uh, guy who rejects once saved, always saved. Um, and this is a girl who, who believes in faith alone. And then at the bottom here, it says, because he has an agenda, don't feel sorry for non once saved, always saved for a second. They have no joy 
and want to rob you of yours. Remember, misery loves company. Okay, wow. Um, I really don't know where to begin on this. So the first thing, so salvation is none of their business. So this right here is to basically say that that, that, that we shouldn't have this discussion at all. This is very, very common with people, with once saved, always savers. They, they think that we shouldn't have this conversation at all, um, and we should just leave everybody alone about it and not ever talk about it, and we should basically just shut up. Now, strangely enough, I do actually agree with him that it is a stupid post, okay? When I'm out evangelizing, often actually Christians are very difficult to deal with because they don't like it when you confront what they already believe. But I find it actually has nothing to do with them being OSAS because you have the same problem with the Catholics and the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and all all those people. And really, whether someone claims OSAS or non-OSAS, it is a sign of an unsaved person that they can't tell you unequivocally that they're saved and they couldn't show you the, the plan of salvation from the Bible. Most of them don't know a Nazarene from a Nazarite, and I do get that. So I acknowledge that it's kind of a stupid post. And he commented about how people are using this to shut down the argument, essentially, and not address these doctrinal issues or make any attempt to defend them. And from other comments that he's put in some of his other videos, I can see that sometimes he has tried to confront Christians about some of this stuff and they shy away from these verses or um, his pastor that he once had didn't answer him or something like that. That doesn't make it wrong, necessarily, folks. That doesn't make the doctrine wrong. But as much as I agree it's a stupid post, it's not really that offensive. It's not personal or directed towards any one individual. If that was addressed against my group of people, I, I wouldn't even flinch. It, it wouldn't bother me in the slightest. Okay. And really, I just find it he, baffling. He started this video saying, if the persecution of people who reject OSAS has not already begun, I think it's begun now. This is pathetic. This is laughable. He thinks he's been persecuted because somebody shared this on social media. It's very generic. It's not directed at him personally. And I agree that it's pathetic, but then the fact that he thinks that that amounts to his persecution is infinitely more pathetic. Now, when you think of people in the Bible who are filled with the Holy Ghost, you might think of someone like Stephen, who was stoned to death, or you might think of someone like Paul, who went through his own trials and tribulations and was also stoned as well. Those were men that were brave men, they were courageous men, they weren't afraid of the world. That's what men filled with the Holy Ghost look like. And he thinks he's been persecuted because of a post on social media, folks. He's not been thrown off a building like in, in an Islamic country. He's not been burned at the stake like the Catholics were doing to people 400, 500 years ago. He's not been locked up in a concentration camp like in North Korea. Someone shared this picture on social media and people comment on it and he thinks he's been persecuted it's frankly pathetic and, and he goes on to explain about how uh, the body of christ should be able to tackle things with with each other but what he doesn't seem to grasp is that from the osas position he's not actually part of the body of christ but that's another um, that you know that's out of the out of the point really this is not persecution right and this this is the thing i've noticed with some of these conditional security folk is that the first little obstruction that they come up with or the, the first line of attack they think they're doing great courageous work for christ they think they're being bold and, and taking a stand for jesus because someone posted something on social media wow well done you so just before i get onto the bible just a few last comments to, to wrap up this first part is that the, the fruit of this man's spirit bearing in mind he tells us that we need to do the works and have the fruits of righteousness for our salvation well he strawmans faith alone he also strawmans osas with calling it gnosticism we'll, we'll get on to that later he but then he whines about persecution when an osas person strawmans conditional security he's hypocritical he debunks his own arguments and he picks contradic contradictory argument points when it suits him to do so and so you know it's like well tell us more about these works of righteousness and, and that's the problem with these people that think that their good works and i know they try and distinguish between the works of the law and the works of faith but but they think that their good works merits their salvation their assurance is in their abiding 
And really, folks, it's it's a house of cards. It stands on the foundations of sand and it's ready to crumble at any moment because you only have to make one or two mistakes and someone exposes you for who you really are and you fall short of the glory of God. Now, in my own way, mercifully, I do feel sorry for him. I think he's tried to confront Christians about some difficult passages and he hasn't had answers. And uh, he did a, a video on his channel where he, he talked about how he tried to confront his pastor and ask his pastor about these things. And he didn't get the support he needed. And I get there and I've, I've been there. Um, but at the end of the day, though, that's no excuse for preaching a false gospel and taking the Bible out of context. It's no excuse for picking contradictory argument points if and when it suits you to do so. And the thing is, even in this video, I'm going to attempt to deal with a lot of the difficult verses that he likes to bring up. I'm going to attempt to deal with some of those really hard go-to passages that he's perhaps never had an answer before, because believe it or not, there are people who believe in faith alone and one saved, always saved, who do know the difference between a Nazarite and a Nazarene. And I'm not all that. I'm not someone who's of eloquent speech, but I'm going to attempt to address some of his difficult passages as much as I can and to show people that he is deceiving them with the way he interprets the Bible. But the thing is, even if he ever watches this, I don't know if he's ever going to watch this video, but I don't think he's going to repent. I think he's been given over to this delusion. I don't know why, um, but he, he's grown around with people with OSAS. He's grown, he's been around people who believe in faith alone. So he's been told what the true gospel is and he wrestles and he wrestles and he wrestles against it. And he gives challenges to Christians where answer this passage. But then if you answer that passage, he's just going to come up with a bunch of excuses anyway, because I've dealt with that with him on, from some of my personal comments. And I'll show you an example perhaps later in the video where he's done that. He'll only give excuses if you try and challenge these difficult passages anyway. So I'm not going to do this for his sake. I don't believe that I'm strong enough to be able to convert this man. I'm doing it for the people that are on the fringes, that think that this man knows the Bible, that think that he's telling the truth. This is, this is for those people, people that are on the fringes and hearing it from both sides and they don't know what to believe anymore. That's why I'm doing this.